Chapter 36, The Flight for Freedom I win, Hagakari yelled, tossing the set of aces that she just collected onto the table, finishing off her hand. She had nothing left and was completely out of the game. Not that it mattered. Yeah, she's got six sets. We're all doomed, sighed Saro, staring at the sets of cards before him, none of which were his. Araraka just stared hesitantly with her singular card. Er... Uno? That's what we're playing next, Mina said menacingly. All for finishing this game here and playing Uno? Nearly everyone raised their hands. Shinso didn't though, mainly because he was one card away from another set, and he was pretty sure Bakugo had it. Oh well, he'd never beat six anyways. We could stay in these pairs to make things a little easier, Yayorzo suggested, vaguely scanning the rules on the back of the Uno box as Ida frantically tidied away the playing cards. Sounds like a plan, Shinso sighed. He said that way too many times this evening. Honestly, he was looking forward to this being over, so he could go to bed and listen to Midoriya's playlist calmly and maybe drift off to sleep, if the gods would permit as such. Okay, do we all know how to play? Questioned Yoyorzo as she handed out a few cards to each player. No, Todoroki frowned, who seemed to have not played any board game ever, but was still rather good at them. You'll catch up quick, Shinzo predicted as he tried not to grin at his plus four card. You've just got to get rid of all your cards, Mina explained. Put them down in one in the middle and is the same color or has the same number. What about those black ones with the plus symbol on it, he frowned. Not that we have one, of course, Shinso added quickly. No, not at all, Juo grinned, rolling her eyes, whispering something to Koda, who had ended up being her partner. Shinso narrowed his eyes at her and sunk further back into his chair. She did the same. Put that down and the next person has to pick up four cards according to the rules, Yoyorzo exclaimed happily. Hagakure won the last round, so she'll go first. Yes, she said, supposedly punching the sky. It was a little hard to tell when everything but her short-sleeved pajama top was invisible. We can't even go, Hagakure, sighed her teammate, Ojiro. She groaned loudly whilst they had to pick up five cards until they finally got the green one that they needed. Okay, everyone make it green again, Kaminari announced with a grin as Shinso took the opportunity to do just that. Oh, come on! You're on my team! But I want to win, he pouted, before fake crying that he never won anything. Shinso was already getting him that grain. I need more coffee. Midoriya was overthinking this. He was giving himself a headache. So many things were going on at once. He didn't even know what emotion to feel. Mr... Canary? Midoriya blinked down at Eri, who had been walking, holding along his hand. Where are we going? Ah, that was a good point. He stopped in his tracks, glancing around. He'd just been walking, still in the mind of getting as far away as possible, without considering actually getting back. There was also the small matter that he had technically just kidnapped someone. That someone seemed rather content with being kidnapped, to be fair. But regardless, other than the name Canary, which the villains had thrown around, Eri didn't really know who he was, why they were here, where they were going, how to get there, when it was all going to be over, and, in the end, what the heck was going on in the first place. Midoriya glanced around, before his eyes settled on a slightly damp bench underneath a sad-looking tree on the side of the road. He pointed at it and pulled Eri towards it, sitting down and helping her shuffle up there too. Okay, right, now... How would he explain all this without being able to speak? To a girl who most definitely didn't know sign language and who probably can't even read? Not that Midoriya had anything to write with, anyways. She blinked at him expectantly. Midoriya sighed. Looked like there was only one option left. To descend to one of the lowest forms of communication that he had to use when no one knew sign language. A rather elaborate game of charades. He pointed at himself and tried to imitate a chatting mouth with his hands before pointing to his mouth and forming a cross over it. Eri just tilted her head to one side and frowned. Wow, this was going great. He did the actions again, but a little slower this time. Eri looked even more confused. Can, can you... can you speak? Midoriya shook his head frantically in agreement. She probably hadn't concluded that from his acting skills, and more from the fact that he'd yet to say a word in which taking a rather roundabout way of trying to explain something to her. Oh, okay, she stammered. Midoriya felt awful, putting this much pressure on the little girl, 
but he didn't have much of a choice. Um, Canary, that, that's your name? Midoriya nodded. Okay, Canary, uh, why did you, why did you do that? Now it was Midoriya's turn to be confused. You, you could have hurt yourself. Why did you take me? Why did you run? Midoriya hesitated. Then, he lifted up his right arm and held it out to her. When he was sure no one was looking, he pulled back the sleeve, revealing the battered cuff and chain hidden underneath. Eri stared at it for a moment, before she realized what he was trying to say. Did they keep you trapped too? Midoriya nodded, pulling his sleeve back over the chain again. Eri blinked up at him. You have bandages on your face, she said, noticing them sticking out from underneath his surgical mask. He instinctively reached up to gingerly touch the left side of his face, where the injury lay. I, I have bandages too, Eri continued, holding up her arms, gazing up with sad eyes. They're supposed to make things better, but they don't. Are you hurt? Midoriya wavered for a moment. Those were not things that a young girl should be saying. But he nodded again, pointing to his jaw. Is that why you can't speak? He nodded, feeling rather stupid that it was all he could do. Eri crumpled the end of her dress in her hands, the bottom of her lip shaking. What do we do now? Where are we going? Midoriya reached out to her and pulled her into a hug. She flinched at it initially, but quickly melted into the touch. It was all he could do to comfort her for now. Okay, next. Time to try and resolve those questions of hers. Midoriya glanced around. He didn't recognize the area. There was no map in sight, and he couldn't exactly ask someone where the nearest police station or hospital was. Besides, he wasn't too happy with going to those locations anyway, considering what happened last time he'd reached a police station. A good amount of time had passed since his escape. The villains were bound to be looking for him, and with Eri present, he wasn't too hard to locate. He needed to get away, to somewhere safe, as quickly as possible. And then his eyes zeroed in on what was behind him. A train station. That could work. He pulled away from Eri, patting her on the head as he stood up. Her big, tearful eyes looked at him, and her bare feet cautiously reached the ground after his encouragement. Minoria bent down and pointed to his back. Fortunately, Eri took the hint and Midoriya was able to carry her piggyback style into the station. The people milling in and out gave him some funny looks, but he didn't try and stop him. As Midoriya wandered around, a little lost. There! A map! He hurried towards it, green eyes scanning the information on a rather familiar train line. He was an hour from UA. That was it! One hour and he would be safe, and every two. Only one problem remained. How to get on to the next train. That left him barely five minutes. An idea sparked in his mind. Ensuring that Eri had a secure enough grip on his shoulders, Midoriya used a free hand to pat down the bulky pockets of his shorts. Sure enough, there it was, the battered remains of his phone. As he removed it from the pocket, spilling a rather large quantity of birdseed out with it, pieces of glass came loose from the screen. It was well and truly knackered. He'd ruined it back when Tokoyami's quirk lashed out in the forest at that summer camp. But after he was taken, one of the villains had made doubly sure it couldn't be salvaged, smashing it against the side of the old bar, before handing the device back to him as a terrible reminder that rescue simply wasn't coming. But there was one other detail about his phone the villains hadn't realized, and if they had, they hadn't seen the importance in it. Because back when he had lost his keycard to the radio station, and he had met Jiro for the first time, he made the decision to keep the orange card concealed between the back of his phone and his phone case. But that wasn't the only card he committed to keeping there. With shaking hands, Midoriya pried the case away and pulled from inside it three perfectly intact cards, one for the radio station, his student ID, and his train pass. His heart soared when he found it. He almost cried. Eri nearly fell off as Midoriya ran into the crowd, weaving through those who weren't in as much of a rush towards the barriers. But that moment of Europa quickly faded when the card failed to do his duty and let the two of them through. Is it not working? Midoriya panicked at the voice, the adrenaline of the situation still persisting in his veins. He calmed a little when he saw it was only a worker at the station. She narrowed his eyes at him, probably not with recognition, but more because of his rather battered state and the equally bad, if not worse, condition that Eri was in. Um, come this way and I'll just let you through, she nodded, urging the two of them to follow her to a broken barrier, as to not stop the flow of people. Perhaps she was just keen to let him keep going, rather than figure out what on earth was wrong. 
Midoriya gave her a quick bow when he passed. She shouldn't have let them pass. Come to think of it, his train card most likely would never have worked for this station regardless. But that wasn't of his concern at the moment, for a train had just pulled up in the platform directly in front of him, and that really was his ticket out of here. Don't you dare, Jiro said, giving Shinso a look. Don't you even dare. And he put his plus four card on top of the other one that Hagakuri had insisted on using. Oh no, Todoroki said helpfully. God damn it, Jiro cried, aggressively snatching the eight cards that Koda had already collected from the pile for her. I was going to win! What color, Ajiro pressed, probably keen to see whether Shinso would continue the whole game routine of making it green at every possible opportunity. Todoroki, Shinso called. He narrowed his eyes at Jiro. Blue. Why? she cried. Everyone laughed hysterically as she was forced to pick up another couple of cards before a blue one could finally be located. Many apologies, Uraraka and Asui. But this is our only possible movement, Tokuyami sighed as he used another skip card. Ah, it's okay. We're not gonna win anyways, Uraraka smiled. Yeah, but I am. Bakugo grinned as he put his last card down. No, Mina yelled. No, we had a strategy. We're on the same team, Bakugo yelled in response. But I wanted to win, she moaned, throwing her second fake tantrum of the night. Okay, we're all tied up, Yoyorzo announced, adding the fourth tally mark to the board. What shall we do to break that? Oh no, Mina insisted. We just played that, Sarah acknowledged blatantly. Yeah, and we suck, Kaminari added. Come on, she protested. Can't we play another game, please? If you can get me more coffee, then I don't mind, Shinso sighed. Same, Todoroki nodded. Your coffee is just pure evil caffeine, Jiro exclaimed, still rather bitter about her loss as she collected in Uno cards from Yeyorzo, shuffling them poorly in her hands. I'll get some, Todoroki offered not trying to deny Jiro's proclamation. Thanks, Shinso nodded. I'll have some too. Oddly enough, came from Bakugo. Full of surprises that night. Shinso raised an eyebrow. Am I not allowed coffee? He snapped. Everyone, please, can we try not to argue about every little thing, sighed Ida. If even Ida was reaching his limit, it must have been bad. So, three cups? Todoroki questioned. Shinso nodded as he wandered away to do just that. Todoroki had never had coffee before coming to the dorms, and when Shinso located the coffee machine, he was quick to ask how to make the stuff. Consequently, he probably didn't know what normal coffee tasted like. Oh well, he was good at making what Shinso liked, and that was all he cared about. Oh, sorry Siren, Jiro said as she dropped a card on the bird's head. She didn't stir. Is she okay? frowned Kirishima, bending down to take a little closer look at Siren. Shinso hadn't even noticed she was awake. No, not really, he admitted. Koto's trying our best talking to her, but we can't get a, a chirp. Not even a wing flap recently. She just sits around and pulls out her feathers, occasionally eating bird seed. Uraraka picked up the cardboard bird nest, being careful not to disturb its overflowing contents. She looks so... sad. She is, Koda said. Sometimes, the words of someone who uttered them rarely meant so much more than those which belonged to someone who always spoke their mind. And despite all the distractions, once again, Shinsu thoughts boomeranged back to Midoriya, and to that one question that had been haunting him for half a month now. Where was he now? Midoriya was on a train. Harry sat on the window seat. As the train started to roll in, Midoriya tapped her on the shoulder and pointed out the window. She looked confused for a moment, but those eyes of her were soon alight with the childlike curiosity that belonged there. It wasn't long before she had her face pressed against the window, watching the world go by. Look, Canary, she whispered, tugging on his sleeve. Look at all the lights. Moroya shuffled up closer to her, lifting her up onto his lap so she was held at a better position, and so he could catch her limbs, too. It was such a trivial thing. The lights of the city, now that the sun had set, but for the two souls... Trapped away from that light for so long, it was enough to muster tears. One hour left. One hour, and it was all over. Where is it taking us? Eri asked, and Midoriya realized he'd never answered. He smiled under his mask and uttered one of the few words that he could. Home. They ended up playing two games of Uno, mainly because it had gotten rather competitive. 
Shinzo was more than happy to end the evening on a high note after Asui and Uraraka reigned victorious for the next game, but everyone else was keen to try their luck with just one more. And then, since Kaminari and Sarah won that one, much to Mina's disappointment, they were, once again, left at a tie. Okay, this will be the last thing we do, I think. Yeah, yours aside. It was starting to get a little late now. What are we doing? Questioned Jiro, who had just as sad as Mina that she never ended up winning Uno. Um, you know, just seemed a little stumped as she turned around again after adding another tally mark to the scoreboard. I don't know. Well, Bakugo chose one, shouldn't Shinso? Shinso took one look at the array of board games before him and said, Charades. Jiro rolled her eyes. No sign language. He hesitated, pouting at her. But can we use our quirks? There was a moment of silence between them all. Shinso grinned. This is going to go horribly wrong. Midori lifted Eri up into his arms, after pulling his hood firmly over his head, double-checking that he still had his phone and various cards on him, and ensuring that the chain on his wrist was still well hidden. He had gotten this far. He might as well go all the way. This was it. He almost skipped out of the train, ignoring the persistent stinging of the side of his face as he grinned stupidly beneath the bandages. Holding Eri tight, he ran out of the station, eyes gleaming as he began to recognize the streets and rising hills. It wasn't long before the glow of UA reached his face. A halo of light surrounding the towering building, a safe haven, the closest thing to home that he could get at the moment. He knew the students, boarded there now, which meant that they were definitely heroes at the school. And since President Mike and Miss Arzawa were both homeroom teachers, there was a good chance that both of them were there. But that wasn't even what excited him the most. He was going to see his friends again, hear their voices, free of the static over the radio. And finally, finally... This whole terrible ordeal would come to a close. Moroya came to a halt outside the looming gates of Yue, the final obstacle. Get inside here, and the villains couldn't touch him. His heart was beating so fast that he was sure it would burst out of his chest. Holding Airy tight, he retrieved his student ID from his pocket, praying that the gates wouldn't slam shut on him, and charged full pelt across the threshold, without the alarms going off. He definitely wasn't crying, as he lowered Airy to the ground, shoved the ID in the back of his phone case, and punched the sky in undoubtable victory. Where? Home? Eric questioned. Midoriya fell to his knees. Home. It's big. Midoriya let out a small laugh and nodded. He almost fell over as he tried to get to his feet again. It was time to close this chapter of his life, once and for all. He held out his hand to Eri, who took it eagerly, and then... After having a quick glance at his surroundings, Midoriya set off to follow the one path that he was unfamiliar with. He snaked around the main building, and the two walked in silence that headed towards several rather large houses emerging from the trees that lined the school. Midoriya didn't falter as he marched straight up towards the building marked 1A, Heights Alliance. He did, however, when he reached the door. The lights were on. He could hear the distant sound of gleeful chatter and booming laughter even a round of applause after a moment. Midori's face hovered before the door, ready to disturb that happiness within. He took a deep breath, and he knocked. Kaminari's acting skills really didn't deserve any kind of applause, but here they were. He bowed clumsily, but somehow regally, to both teams. Honestly, Shinsuke wasn't sure how Kirishima had managed to realize that was meant to be a donkey, but he could respect it. Okay, Shinso's team, Iyoyozo exclaimed, indicating towards their group. Go on, Raven, it's your go, Jiro grinned. She's obviously looking forward to this. He sighed exasperatingly. Okay, then. Putting his cup of coffee on the table beside Siren, he stood up and took center stage. He picked up the first card from the pile. Crap. Seriously? He groaned loudly and put the card face down on the table. You guys have used your quirks. Am I allowed to use mine? The fact that no one immediately replied was more than suspicious. Shinso grinned. Come on, any takers? Kaminari stood up and saluted. I volunteer. He instantly fell under Shinso's power. Ordering him to walk towards him without walking into the table, Shinso stepped close to Kaminari and whispered his instructions in his ears. Act like a crab. He wasn't surprised that Uraraka had borrowed Asui's phone to film the ordeal and was more than happy because the result would have been the highlight of the night if it weren't for certain later events. Everyone was laughing so hard that they didn't even bother guessing, 
and Shinto had to save Kaminari, who had begun sidestepping frantically across the room before he walked right into a wall. They didn't hear the knocking at the door. What they did hear was Siren. Tweet! Everyone stopped. Siren? Raka frowned. Hey, she, she made a noise. The little green bird hopped out of her nest, acting more energetic than she had since, well, since the summer camp ended. Tweet, tweet. Koda, what's she saying? Questioned Mina eagerly, forgetting about the game altogether as she leaned forwards to get a closer look at the bird. But Koda's expression simply conveyed an apparent bewilderment. Jiro suddenly jerked upright. Someone's here, she said, and lo and behold, a moment later, they heard it. Knock, knock, knock. The class fell silent again, everyone staring at the front door in confusion. Who could it be at this hour? wondered Yoyorzo. Shinjo broke his hold on Kaminari as he, being the closest, approached the door. Huh? What happened? Kaminari blinked. Did it work? Shinjo wasn't paying attention because, well, he had a very strange feeling about this. His hand reached the doorknob, which was where he wavered. He glanced back at the others. A few nodded encouragingly. It's probably just someone from Class B, Kirishima supposed. I did lend to Tetsu my mask book the other day. Maybe he's here to give it back? Yeah, that seemed like a reasonable explanation. Shinto shook off that weird feeling and pulled open the door.